Great to have you on today's edition of Press Our Ladies and Gentlemen. Thank you once again for being there for us. We're going to give you, as usual, just the best of what we have here on CRTV on this special edition of Press Our Special because we may be going on recess. But before we go on recess, we're going to serve you just what we think that is the best for you. And our topic also is special. Special because we are asking you and asking ourselves whether we can remake Cameroon. And not just asking, we're going to propose to you from our different perspectives how we think we can remake Cameroon. That's our topic. And to talk about this topic that touches every one of us in Cameroon, on set we have Madame Kwenusi Wazi Nicolin. She is a jurist, she is a gender and development expert. We're happy to have you on the set. Thank you, Kilian. My pleasure to be part of this panel. Pleasure shared. I said, ladies first, I'm going to move over to uh, Comfort Musa. Comfort Musa is a photojournalist. She is communications expert. She also is the coordinator of Sisters Speak 237. I think for some of you who know what 237 represents, it simply represents Cameroon and she coordinates that uh, advocacy organization. Musa Comfort, you're welcome to press R. Thanks for having me, Kelly, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are pleased to have you on our set, Comfort. And just next to you is Ateki Seta Caxton, who is the director, uh, executive director of Network for Solidarity, Empowerment, and Transformation for All, New Seta. And I would like to introduce you on this set as a transformational entrepreneur. We're happy to have you and we want to have you share your experience with us and tell us on the set and Cameroonians out there how you think that we can remake Cameroon. You're welcome to this program. Thank you so much, Kilian. Um, I'm very happy to be here. You are most welcome and don't ask me why I have decided to introduce Julius Nyamkima Fondong who is an author, he is a governance expert, he's a public policy analyst, and he also is a conflict management consultant. He has worked in this country as an administrator, a civil administrator at a higher level. He has worked around the world as uh, a UN worker. He is here with us, he is still a United Nations worker based in the Democratic Republic of Congo, he decided to come here, share his experience, and tell us what he thinks that we can do to remake Cameroon. We are pleased to have you on this set, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Kilian. It's always a pleasure to be back here on CRTV, but I just need to stress one thing before we go on into the, uh, into the panel discussions, that the views I'm going to express on this panel are my personal views and do not in, in any manner, shape, or form represent the official views of the United Nations. Thank you very much. That is uh, taking note of, ladies and gentlemen, you can see then that what we are going to be talking about on this set. For those who have that uh, perception of a glass half full and half empty, we are going to take both sides. If you look at it as half empty, please feel it. If it is half full, feel it. That is our take on this set today. So we're going to make Cameroon a better place to be. That's why we have this topic again. Can we remake Cameroon? We're going to start with the first things on this program. And it is press review done for us by Yoti Kale. Listen, guy. Yoti. <laughs> As the globe prepares to cheer their favorites in the 2022 FIFA World Cup, we highlight what the papers wrote this week on the football jamboree. Cameroon Insider has fans questioning the credibility of Rigobert Song's 26 Lions. Four names stand out in the newspaper as some football pundits wonder if the indomitable Lions coach intends to go far in the tournament. Meanwhile, the horizon focuses on Samuel Eto and Roger Mila as the only Africans to have featured amongst FIFA's best number nines ever. The countdown to the World Cup takes readers of the Guardian Post in retrospect. 
spotlighting how African representatives at the World Cup fared in their last warm-up games, with wishes for the continent to put up a good fight. Another edition of the same paper indicates that regardless of Cameroon's performance, the Indomitable Lions will share $1.5 billion as bonuses for participating in the World Cup. Cameroon Tribune, however, reassures fans that the Lions have put finishing touches in order to perform brilliantly at the tournament. A squad, the Herald Tribune discloses, was the first to be unveiled in Africa. The papers also took an interest in parliamentary activities, giving readers updates on the various bills adopted. Just as municipal updates, reports that Canada is appreciating Cameroon's new decentralization drive. The Dawn, on its part, revisited the happenings in Bangem, where the population is on alert to flush out Ambazonia fighters. Meanwhile, the Post is keen on the National Anti-Corruption Commission's ranking of the Finance, Education and Defense Ministries amongst the eight most corrupt state institutions. The Print Press is still not done talking about the seizure of Dan Polo's assets, with lawyers enunciating that legal and diplomatic actions against South Africa are inevitable. These and more were recounted in various newspaper editions of the week. Thank you very much, Yoti Kalele Songe. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just tuning in, this is CRTV and you are watching your Sunday afternoon favorite program, Press R. Our topic today is Can We Remake Cameroon? And from the press review that you just watched, one theme, one thing that ran across the review is the World Cup in Qatar. We just want to talk about Cameroonese participating, um, beginning with uh, the uh, most senior uh, panelist here, Julius, our country is participating in uh, Qatar 2022. Cameroon will be playing on Thursday, that is uh, November 24, but the game, the tournament is starting today. Um, what do you say about our participation and uh, about the World Cup in general? Uh, I think what we should do, uh, what I want to start by saying is that I want to wish the, the, uh, the Lions well. Uh, I've been in the country for the past one week and I've followed, as it was said in the press, uh, review the uh, little uh, contentions out there, whether are we prepared, are we better prepared now than we were in other World Cups, uh, was the choice of players the right, the, the, the right one, but we are Cameroon and after everything we always go through these uh, moments of self-doubt, through these uh, moments of contention, then after that we all, then, then the Lions will, will, will roar and, 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 and get things done. So my belief is that you know that's what makes us fundamentally Cameroonian we go through these stages then we then we, we, we prevail so I believe that the Lions will, will, will do well uh, I have no choice but to think so because I'm Cameroonian mm -hmm. and uh, and to wish the, 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 the Lions well and also to ask every Cameroonian that now that the the, the, the 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 competition has started it's time to bury our various differences differences and all line up uh, behind the lions and give them uh, the encouragement that, that i think they need thank you very much and i move i'm beginning in, uh, with me i move to you caxton you, you you see for one thing like uh, julius uh, is saying the lions left this country more than a week to the beginning of the tournament and the apparently and openly are satisfied with the treatment. They are going to uh, distribute 1.5 billion CFA francs. This, at least psychologically, they should be prepared. Um, yes, I think uh, it's very important to um, incentivize our teams, our players, those who represent the nation. It's important to um, give them appropriate incentives to be able to defend the country. Um, I also very um, want to appreciate uh, especially the, the fan club. Um, I've seen a lot of Cameroonians out there in Qatar already at the airport. They are very enthusiastic about um, about the game. I've seen <coughs> young musicians and artists from Cameroon who are there 
singing songs, patriotic songs, and encouraging the Lions. I think the spirit is really good. Um, the vibes from Qatar are looking great, and I'm hoping that uh, the Lions will be able to ride on this uh, wave of optimism that uh, everyone is uh, uh, imbued with to be able to uh, bring us the, the goods back home. I also join um, our senior... Uh, Julius? Uh, yes, I want to join Julius to wish uh, the Lions well uh, in their um, outing in Qatar. Kami? Well, I can only echo and re echo what is on the lips of every Cameroonian. We go take that cup. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's more than just a slogan, you know, and it's cutting across every youth group youth uh, group and even adults are saying we could take that cup. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a positive vibe that everyone is, you know, queuing into and it's prophetic to say like we're hopeful that we're going to take the cup and uh, we hope that the Lions will deliver and so I'm wishing them all the best out there in Qatar. <laughs> We all wish the Lions the best. I love because you're saying it with a lot of hope in you. Uh, uh, Nicolene, are you going to shout, are you preparing <coughs> to shout Abu Shu or Chupo Shu? <laughs> <laughs> um, Kilian, I can only add my voice to that of the panelists to wish our indomitable Lions uh, good luck and that they bring back the cup. But it's rather unfortunate that uh, view what is happening in the country I am looking at this cup with so much mixed feelings, looking at the incentives that are given to lions. If Cameroonians of different sectors, like the teachers, the doctors, they are also incentivized to work for Cameroon, I think it would be Cameroon should not be football first. We have failed to use, to leverage on football. Football is one of those things. The Olympic Games were founded, for instance, to bring different nations together after uh, the world wars. There was a way to bring nations together, right? And we have failed, we have advocated, we have begged that we use the outcome that took place in Cameroon to look for a solution for what is happening in Cameroon and we have not seen this happening. And when we talk, it's like we are trying to use football as a distraction of what is happening in Cameroon. So I, Cameroonians going to the World Cup is a beautiful thing, but I receive it with lots of mixed feelings <laughs> with the things that are happening in the country and the incentives that are given to Cameroonians and ignoring the other people that work on the day-to-day -day basis for the well-being of Cameroon. You have a uh, right to say all of that, but if I just had to take on you, on what you have said, the example you have given, the teachers, the budget has been reviewed since uh, last year, this year, just because of teachers. Teachers, football comes like the World Cup, it comes once in four years. We have not been singing the same song. Why don't we just allow and say that if we were to grow higher, taller in football, we should go behind that, not as a kind of distraction, but as part of the whole holistic way of developing the country. That's our opinion. It comes to Thank that you was very just my Thank you very my much. own opinion. Thank, Thank you, and, and as I said, it counts. <laughs> um, we are going to move <coughs> into our topic now, and it is can we remake Cameroon? Of course, I will just ask the question, simple question, and get the answer before we go, we'll go into the discussion. Can we remake Cameroon? Beginning, I just go around. Come. Well, Kilian, I will respond with a question. Why do we need to remake Cameroon? Are you very satisfied with what is happening in the country so that you think that we should just keep it going? Why do we need to remake? Why do we need to remake Cameroon? This is we're having a topic that says, Can we remake Cameroon? Yes. And I want us to start from why should we remake Cameroon? Because when <coughs> purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. So, if you think there is a problem and we need to remake Cameroon, let us start from this is where Cameroon is, and then we will now tell you, Can we remake it or not? So, I would love to hear from you, Kalian. Why do we need to remake Cameroon? And I'm very available to share uh, my opinions and thoughts about can we actually remake? Thank you very much, and I am going to stay with you on that. Personally, I feel that every day we are striving to be better. And Nicolin just said we have so many things that we have to tackle. And I think we need to remake Cameroon a better place. 
which to so be. Many, which so many things because um Kilian, can we remake cameroon uh, i don't want us to get caught up in the big slogans we're a country of big slogans and big campaigns but i am one of the cameroonians that think that if we have to be better we have to be intentional and specific can we remake Cameroon? Yes, we can remake Cameroon is another big slogan. But, yeah. but, but what goes into it? I will ask so you that why question. why do we need to remake Cameroon? Now, we take you. Comfort Musa is a success story. Comfort Musa is a multi-award winner. Comfort Musa, if you type her name on Facebook, on Google, you're going to see it's going to ring so many bells across. We count you as a success story. We want you to tell Cameroonians generally tell young boys tell young girls what did you do as an individual to come up to this level so that they follow your example mm. and we go ahead those are some of the things we're going to talk about do you want to start right away since you asked me i've answered you what did it take for you to be what you are today well, I will, I will start, of course, by acknowledging my privileges. I am a woman who, I'm a young girl who had an opportunity to go to a good school, but there are thousands of Cameroonians and millions in many regions of, of, uh, of the country in the far north who don't have that access to school. So what worked for me will not exactly, I will not say if you do A, B, C like I did, you're going to get A, B, C according to the results that I get. So I acknowledge the, the privileges and some of the access that I had to go to school, to get mentors. And there are many other people who do not have these opportunities. Those are some of the things we re we need to remake and making uh, um, uh, remaking Cameroon. So when I share my experience here, I am aware that everyone may not have been born into a region where you had uh, access to school or access to hospitals or vaccinations. Because I've been to the far north and I've seen kids studying under the tree. I've seen kids at 20 who have never seen the four walls of a classroom. So uh, I am one out of 20 and I speak for myself but not for every other youth who may not, like I said, have had the opportunity to even get vaccines. Now, let me remind you, commit the literacy rate in Cameroon is 105%. It's over hundred percent again we need to interrogate this statistics 100 and five percent percent uh, who fits into this 105 percent Killian yes and simply yeah. in every village in Cameroon we have schools what kind of schools you have schools it's a fact secondly some people who didn't go to school at our age they are going to school as adults that's a, a fact and those are the uh, various criteria that are taken into consideration and I repeat we are saying it publicly that the literacy rate in Cameroon is 105 percent and I can quote the Minister of Basic Education if you meet him he will repeat this to you now Kami, can you go again access is more now than when it was in your time so you need you need now to encourage other people to succeed like you. That is why we have this topic. Of course. And that's why I said when I speak, I, I um, acknowledge my privilege. I acknowledge the access that I had. And so I do that so I can be inclusive of those who do not have the privilege. And I've given you examples of communities and places where I've gone. And I've seen girls at 20 who do not go to school. And when we say there are schools in every village, what kind of schools? What quality of education? We have schools where teachers are posted there and they would prefer to resign than to go there because of you know the social amenities so when we are talking about making Cameroon better I was asking these questions Killian because I wanted us to start from a premise of what do we need to fix before exactly we get into now you throwing in big words now you you, you, you actually uh, you've got the point that we know where we are going to uh, so you're saying we have a problem of education and other things that we need to fix every aspect of life we need to do it to get it better that's what we are talking about I'm glad we've, uh, we, we've acknowledged and started on that premise. <laughs> okay. That there's a lot to be fixed. Yes, Casting, uh, 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 can we remake Cameroon? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I would uh, I want to really uh, begin just by saying uh, those who have been with some level of responsibility in this country, uh, the executive, the judiciary, the legislative, they have been doing their part to... Um, well, to, to make the efforts that are necessary to move Cameroon forward. And when we see we want to remake Cameroon on this panel, I don't necessarily think that we are um, disregarding what has been done or not acknowledging their efforts. Um, it's just that the you know, current realities that are lived by Cameroonians are, um, of course, uh, still far from being 
um, adequate, uh, still far from being um, the most um, anticipated by everybody. And so we, we, today we have a Cameroon that um, is replete with uh, different kinds of conflicts um, in the north, in the northwest and southwest, which is something very obvious today. Um, we have tribal conflicts. We have um, so the task I think that we really need to ask ourselves is um, how do we contemplate a, a form of community consensus in Cameroon that is devoid of demands for unanimity. These conflicts are arising sometimes because of maybe um, we've not really managed our diversity well, we've not been able to um, understand that everyone who is a Cameroonian today um, thinks, feels, behaves and believes that they're Cameroonian and should be treated as a Cameroonian. But if we have Cameroonians today who feel um, a certain amount of indignation against the government, against um, different authorities or the institutions and then the diminishing trust that you find in, the, in, the, in political parties even today or the press or I mean just or other, uh, or other as aspects. aspects. So this, um, I think, um, provides grounds for, 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 for a remaking of Cameroon. We, today, I would say the conflicts that exist, for example, um, are a betrayal even of our own values. We, we as Cameroon, I don't think that there's any culture in Cameroon today that would, um, would prune violence and the killing and, and of innocent people for any reason. So if we find ourselves today in Cameroon fighting one against another, it's a betrayal of our own values. And I think it's something that we need to sit back and, 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 and think how we, we can remake this. Because the task of every generation, um, of this generation of Cameroonians, is to prepare Cameroon for the next generation so they can be able to carry on the country forward. Now, are we really succeeding in that task? Well, that's a question I cannot answer, but we're moving forward. Uh, I'll come back to you to ask uh, about your experience, not immediately. Uh, Kome, you know that you have not yet spoken to young Cameroonians to come up to your level. The time is coming. Uh, I'm going to move forward. Uh, I will skip uh, uh, Julius Namkima Fondong, uh, Fondong to uh, Nicolin for reasons that I will tell you later because uh, Julius is an author. He has written a book that actually gives us some principles that we will follow, we will actually remake this country. So I will get uh, Nicolin's view first, then <coughs> come and set the ball at the higher gear when I, can, when I come back to Julius. Yes, Nicolin. Uh, thank you, Kilian. I will affirmatively and very optimistically and convinced say that we can remake Cameroon. And if I say so, it's because I acknowledge that things have not been going on well in this country. We have witnessed the Boko Haram violent extremism in the far north region, the Anglophone crisis, the COVID-19, and how government has managed the COVID-19. We are actually witnessing the global uh, uh, um, crisis. crisis, inflation, and the worsening humanitarian situation in the country, as I can put it. And all of this, I think we, it, it, it is like a call for us to sit up and see what has been going on in this country. We are not creating Cameroon like God created the world, Good. or like, like well, God created the world, but we can remake Cameroon. By remaking Cameroon, we are acknowledging that certain things have not gone on well, and we need to sit up for those things. And for us to sit up for those things, we need one thing, which should be our mantra, willpower. We need willpower to remake Cameroon and make it even a more beautiful country than we have it. Other countries have fallen lower than Cameroon, and they have remaked their countries, and today they are envious. I, take, I love to quote Rwanda, because that is something that happened when I was an adult, and I have witnessed it. It has been my case study on many issues. We can see Rwanda. We can see South Africa came out of apartheid. We can see Sierra Leone came out of war. We can see Liberia came out of war. We can see countries, Solomon Islands. There are, there are too many in the world. We can remake Cameroon and we need that willpower. And for that willpower to exist, we need a political will. We need political will to activate that willpower. Political will that is gen that we, we can be able to genuinely identify the, on the underlying causes the contributing factors, the key players that interact to, to turn the, that interacted to turn the country upside down. Because if somebody is not aware that this country is upside down, that person is just denying to accept the truth. And we need to turn it right side up again. 
and for it to be right side up again, we need to address this issue and we need willpower, which will be activated by political will. And of course, we need to, I don't know if we should enter into them. That political will will be political will that can help us address issues of corruption and embezzlement of state funds and resources. We can no longer pretend as if these things don't exist in this country. We need political power that will help us to rebuild the machinery of government, creating the right institutions and putting the right people at the right places, avoiding arrogance and, meritocracy and, and mediocrity that we have been celebrating in this country and giving meritocracy a place. And I hope I will have time to yes, come back yes, to yes. all of these things. We'll give you yes, time. We need you to see, we have listened to you actually express yourself. We're going to give you more time. And I told you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, I'm, I'm going to end this first part of uh, the discussion with uh, Julius Nyamkima, Nyamkima Fondong, who is an author, is a governance expert, he's a public policy analyst and conflict management um, consultant. I should also even give you some background because he has written, he has written a book called Reviewing the Promise. Um, and the, in the book, Reviewing the Promise, he... Renewing the Promise. Uh, re renewing, the renewing, promise. renewing, renewing the Promise. Uh, thank you very much. He has uh, prescribed certain principles that we have to follow. And in my words, Remek Cameroon, in his words, we uh, go we move forward in our country. Uh, just to remark that you, before uh, working where you are today, you had been a uh, divisional officer in this country, uh, different places. You have worked, uh, and then you decided to go to some other areas. You've come back. You're still there, but you make sure that you come back to rebuild your country. Now, renewing the promised. Um, as it is said, it's a treatise on the foundation of the Cameroonian nation. What exactly are you talking about here? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kilian. I, I think the, the, the substance of the book kind of uh, relates to the, uh, to, to the discussions that you know, we, are, we are having on this table right now. And I think uh, the topic uh, s uh, speaks to the fact that we all acknowledge that uh, our country is not where it ought to be when we look at, when we look at uh, our, our social constructs, economic constructs, and our foundations, and the promises that uh, defined the, the founding of this nation. We look about the promises that were made to us at the time that this, the, we made to ourselves at the time that this nation was founded. Uh, we, look, we, we look at uh, 61, 61 years after unification uh, 50 years after the peaceful Re revolution yeah, of 1972, in 1972 mm. and 40 years into the New Deal and all, all of those, uh, the conceptual basis of those changes in our national life and we ask ourselves so where are we today, are we where where we ought to be, and that's that's the that's the that's the essence of the book. But to come to the point of Komi and what you asked, where are we as a nation? I could just just run to give you some numbers that you will find in the book in chapter two of the book that tells us exactly where we are or where where that gives us an idea about who, where we are. I call it the state of play. If you talk about uh, education, yes, Komi, you are right. You know, and, and Kilian, you are also right because access to education has been improved uh, through the, uh, the, 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 the 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 creation of many more schools than we had when we were growing up. But the problem that lies with these schools is the quality of education that we have now in our primary schools. Uh, the the uh, the government, in its own assessment of the quality of primary education, did say in 2019 that 60% uh, of kids graduating from primary school do not have the threshold competency in literacy and numeracy. It went for that to state that 90% of kids graduating from primary school do not, do, not, uh, do not have the basic competency in solving problems that can allow them go through life without or, or further their studies without uh, difficulty. Uh, and only 37%, that's by the government's own assessment, only 37% of primary school teachers in this country have the basic competency in math. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at these numbers, they reflect themselves in higher education because if you look at, I did the numbers for the trend in uh, enrollment in higher educational institutions for the, uh, for the past 10 years. And you see that 90% of kids enrolling in higher education are enrolling in the humanities and in the uh, 
social sciences and only less than six percent are enrolled in in courses of stem that is science technology mm -hmm. engineering and math i could go on and on in health 70 percent of this of the state expenditure is borne by households mm -hmm. and in 2010 it amounted to about 475 billion francs cfa the uh, the the the, the, the Regional threshold uh, threshold for for sub-Saharan Africa is thirty percent. We have not been able to get uh, universal uh, health care okay. out of the door, and these out-of-pocket expenditures, in the context where we are, we we, we have a a Gini uh, co coefficient of forty, which makes us one of the most unequal countries on the continent, along with South Africa, makes it difficult for people to access health care. I can go on and on. I will just leave it at that. Yes. So we can we can we can work the numbers and we can come to a conclusion that no, we are probably not where we are supposed to be. Mm. Therefore, the need to, to remake make. and refound and rethink and re-engineer our country. No. Thank you very I can much. Give you the same numbers in roads, in uh, poverty, uh, in unemployment, in uh, access to uh, power, to, to to energy, and so on. So for that. I have all of them in my book in page two or on, in chapter two. Yes, uh, thank you very much for me, holding me uh, by the hand to call me. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm uh, glad now, for that premise. Yes. I'm glad for that premise because Kilian, uh, like I was saying, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. If we want to talk about remaking, it's good to come from a place of this is a problem. Now we can comment about how do we fix this. Very good. Now I take it back to you, uh, Julius. In your book, you say uh, governance, we should have a governance-based practice. What do you actually mean by this? Uh, I, I, I call it an uh, overarching governance-based practice for the re-foundation of Cameroon based on the principles of uh, decentralized governance, uh, public service delivery, enhanced public service delivery, and and, th and and three a, a paradigm shift shift from transactional leadership to transformational leadership i couldn't explain that but i will, uh, no you need to explain for for, for, de for decentralization we know that's the song of the day yeah. you have to uh, tell us about the two others enhanced public service delivery and uh, uh, strategize or uh, strategic uh, shift from, from a transactional to a transformational. Transactional yes, those two things need okay. to know that. You know, uh, there are, there are so, there's a phrase that uh, was inscribed in our constitution since 1961, which very few people pay attention to. The constitution of 1961 said, the Federal Republic of Cameroon shall be democratic and, and dedicated to social service. Mm -hmm. So the founders of this country from the outset didn't want our sovereignty to be seen in terms of our military might, mm -hmm. in terms of the exercise of authority by SDUs and, and, and DUs and ministers in big cars and, and, and in villas, but we were to be judged by the quality of services that we render to the population. That's why they inscribed it in the constitution that as a nation, our sovereignty shall be based on our ability to render basic social services to the population. That's what they meant by a nation dedicated to uh, social service. Right now, I do not think that we are paying that much attention to that yet. That's why we see, uh, I, I could work the numbers again and tell you, and, and, and tell you that you, know, you need to link uh, public service delivery to decentralized governance. Why? Because decentralized governance functions on the basis of allocative efficiency. Mm. What does that mean? That decisions for how resources should be uh, allocated and, and how and what projects should be, uh, should, be, should be implemented must be negotiated, discussed with the beneficiary community. So it's not about uh, a minister sitting in the, on the and, and, and deciding that the people in Oku need a classroom and then just give it to them. Or that the people in Bali need a health center somewhere and then we give somebody a contact in Yaoundé to go to, 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 to Bali and, and build a health center. If we, need to sp if we need to spend our money well and have better out outcomes in our projects, then we need to apply the principles of allocative efficiency, which demands that these decisions about service delivery must be done at the level where those services are to be rendered, not taken outside of those. Uh, I, I, I think that point is important. I will uh, get it around before you come to a uh, strategic shift from transactional to a transformational uh, leadership uh, paradigm, uh, uh, beginning with uh, Nicolene. 
Yes, as he, as he says, we have to enhance public service delivery. Of course, that is one of the points I have on my paper here. Yes. Because uh, uh, government cannot be a government of some people. And they sit in their air-conditioned offices in Yaoundé and decide what should happen at the grass field. Government should be a government, as he has said, the mission of every government is to provide social services for the benefit for the, uh, to the citizens after the participatory with the citizens, which means there should be that thing in development that they call, like at the grassroots level, rural appraiser. Government should be able to brainstorm with the grassroots citizens to know what are their needs, access what are their assets and what are their needs before they, they jointly agree on what they should have. And for this to be effective, there should be social accountability. Mm. I go back to my most famous Rwanda, which is my, my case study. In Rwanda, there is a type of contract between the government, whether they are appointed representatives or elected representatives, and the citizens. Before you go to parliament, before you go to the regional assembly, or whatever you think you can go and represent people, there's a contract between you and the people. And there is a plan of action jointly agreed upon between you and the people. And there is a timeline for the achievement of every item on that contract. If you fail to achieve that item and you don't convince the beneficiary on why you didn't achieve that item, they simply give you a vote of non-confidence and they call you back and tell you you are no longer fit to represent us. But we have a situation in Cameroon where we had elections in this country between 2018 and 2020, and you needed to have the privilege to enter an ammo car to go and vote. Who, who are these people representing? Well, whatever the case, that, those, those are exceptional cases because of war, and it happens in uh, every country. Now, the question but not, not they, everybody they, the question, voted, and no. these people are supposed to be our yeah. representatives. Yeah, they, a few individuals went and voted them because they have access to ammo yeah, cars. Yeah, uh, so are uh, these uh, that our point, people? That point taken, the, the question I ask you from what you are saying mm. is you are making very good points. But don't you also see that this government that we have, is aware of that, and that's why they are working on accelerating the decentralization process. Because actually, they are working on that. Yeah, they may be working, they may be aware of uh, what is happening, Kilian, but I'm very sorry. I will say, like, my I forgot to announce here that uh, Nyamkima was my teacher in secondary school, oh, yeah. English <laughs> language, and, and they say, uh, uh, a good seed must resemble punky. So, I uh, like. I think uh so you resemble him. <laughs> okay, we we'll, we'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Casting uh, well elaborated as points. He's talking about public service delivery. Mm -hmm. It has to be uh, reviewed. We have to enhance it. How do we, from your perspective, you are uh, an entrepreneur? We mean that you are the master of your own uh, life. Uh, uh, you are. Uh, executive director. So how do you do it in the private sector that the public service should resemble what happens in the private sector? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Before before I uh, even um, I, I, I comment on that, I just want to um, um, say something about decentralization, which is um, actually um, evoked and begin with this analogy. If you were to write the, the story of, of industry uh, well, the development of industry in the 19th century, from the perspective of the factory owners, you would you would find that they would that period would represent a period of capital development, capital accumulation, and growth. But if you were to write that story from the perspective of the worker who had to spend 18 hours working just to be able to secure a wage for his family, um, for people who were struggling to uh, make sure that the employer can even recognize workers' unions that were advocating for just decent yeah, wages right, for yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it, then you'd find that you might arrive at two radically different conclusions. I think it's the same thing if you look at um, decentralization in Cameroon. If you were to talk about it from the perspective of those who are designing the policies and those who right now are, have some mandate to implement it, they will tell you that um, it is effective, it is working, and I'm not saying this to say decentralization is good or bad. I think decentralization um, is hugely dependent on how it is designed and implemented. 
So in Cameroon today, I think we have political administrative and, and, and I would say fiscal decentralization, uh, which are all intertwined. You cannot separate one from the other. So if you have more political decentralization while downplaying the physical, the fiscal aspect of that scenario, I think you, it would lead to a very um, a lopsided process. It would be a failed process. And I think one of the, the, the challenges that you find today on the ground is um, having moved to, you know, with different, to different regions, working with municipal councils and, and mayors and talking to people on the ground. I, I mean, you, you find that sometimes it is very difficult for the, the councils to be able to just implement their own agenda because they don't have spending power. Something as simple as that. They, like you, you may have well, Article um, Eleven of the the the, the, the code, code. And, yes the talks code about and you know and, that and they can actually get revenues from um, from um, taxation, right? And from uh, from maybe subventions that will come from the government. If you look at OECD countries, the taxation that they receive, I mean, from an, a report that was done, is like forty seven percent. They can raise enough taxes from their local councils, and then they get like 37% of uh, government subventions. In Cameroon today, I don't know how um, um, it works out, but um, sometimes one of the cries that you hear from the ground is that the 15% of the national budget that was supposed to be allocated to decentralized um, um, entities. entities, sometimes is not forthcoming. Sometimes they have to struggle in, in order to get it. And that alone really places a limit on the, the, the potential of these local uh, institutions, which are more closer to the realities of the people, uh, to be able to change, uh, in, to make impact in any, in a concrete way. Uh, and, and actually, I think it's the same thing that you would look at in, in different um, um, sectors as well, that would, would require us to, I mean, make more concrete investments. Like you look at the, the like what he raised about education. You said we are at 105%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, I think it's a very, um, 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 uh, well, it's... When it's sectoral, it is about 87. But global, it's 105. 107, 105. Yes. Now, um, he has said that 90% from his report, 90% are enrolling in the humanities. Yes, science. Yeah, and, and when you look at, when you look at um, spending, um, spending, uh, spending differences in other countries that have evolved, like the United States. The United States has uh, like a 20 or 21 trillion economy right now, yeah. and they spend 2.5 percent of their GDP on, on on research and development and on innovation. Africa, as a whole, has a two trillion economy, and we spend one percent of our GDP on, on, research. on research and innovation. And and we want to come and uh, talk about the bioeconomy, the ethanol economy, the hydrogen economy. This is this is the fourth industrial revolution that people are talking about. And we we spending just this very very uh, uh, you know small amounts of money on something as important for our development on in, uh, as innovation, I think we, we, we really need to stop and ask ourselves, are these you know, investments really taking us to where we want to go as, as a country or as even a continent? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think this is something we need to uh, interrogate and, and try as much as possible, like you said, to focus on, 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 on STEM education, on TVETs, like technical vocational education training. This is something that is very crucial to really build a diverse potential of human capital for our innovation uh, uh, and, and development in Cameroon and in Africa. You, you so. see, we had to listen to you because uh, it's so uh, interesting to listen to such a, a development. But you've not uh, applied the question and asked you is how do we, they said we have to uh, review our public service uh, delivery. Uh, you are of the private sector and you are a boss of your own. How does it function in such a way that we could transpose, if not uh, re replicate it, to work in the way it works in the private sector, mm. we take it to the public sector. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very um, um, simple answer to that question. Uh, Komi said earlier on, um, if you want to design something, you need to look at the purpose the purpose of it before you can be able to design um, solutions and, and and set standards. I think in the private sector we have we have um, challenges. Um, first of all, um, there are there are big monopolies um, that would limit, I would say, competition very often. Um, people who uh, want to get into maybe telecommunications right now, for example, in Cameroon, they have to contend with MTN Orange, and and you know these are big spenders. We 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 need to make sure that we can get even as like you know a possibility for smaller companies in Cameroon to be able to get into spaces where they can they can uh, can survive and thrive. Because if you have 
all, you know, these existing monopolies who have, um, you know, uh, possibilities to make decisions that are on a discre discretionary uh, basis and without accountability. I think sometimes it's, it's, uh, it leads to corruption very often because f sometimes when you look at the way this private sector is, is regulated, you know, there's too much regulation. Sometimes you have to find, um, yeah, you know, yeah. long procedures yeah. in order to be able to yeah, start yeah. up a business, in, in, in long procedures in order to build, to have a building permit. I mean, in some countries, I've seen like 57, 57, not in the Cameroon, but 57 yeah, yeah. Process, that yeah. processes that you have to go through in order to have a building permit. Yes. That's room for corruption. It's yes. not uh, just no, for, no, nobody for, for condones that. Nobody condones that. Uh, Cameroon lost about 43 billion or something uh, to corruption in 2021. That That is a fact. But the just in 30 seconds, you know you've been talking for so long. Um, don't you think that the smaller holdings at your level uh, are not prospering or not making a difference because you are not spending on the same research that you talked about, you're spending on something else? No, let me, let me just say something. I am in the civil society, in the civil society sector. Now, um, the reality that we have, just please, um, the reality that we have now, one, sector, one minute, yes, you know, we have to go around, is that we have. Um, you know, the problem of regulation. Take something like the law of 1990 that um, governs civil society organizations in Cameroon. Article 11 clearly states that we are not supposed to receive money from <laughs> government entities or... And so you would find, you set up, you allow the space for organizations to be created and then they don't have a means to be able to implement their agenda. So where does the funding for the four, well, we talked about 4% of the GDP <laughs> that is spent on innovation. Where do we get the money to do that? So we, we in fact, we, it's an external. It happens in other countries where the private uh, companies, the private holdings, they go out for this. Uh, let me just take this example why they do that. Uh, for example, what I know, in the uh, elections in America, they say oh, either you take what the government gives you or you, you renounce that and go for uh, uh, personal uh, funding. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the system in the world. So you can't just depend on government. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you very much. Let's <laughs> let other people speak. Right, yeah. uh, coming, we were on uh, public service delivery. Are we on that uh, page? Are you with us? Yes, I'm, I'm with you on that page, Killian. And I just want to say if we want to remake Cameroon and we're looking at public service delivery, then we should be hoping and um, looking forward to a system that is built not around individuals. I explain. Mm. For if you say there is a recruitment today, mm. the first thing people ask is, do you know someone? You actually have family members and ex students asking, who do we know on the inside? Even for vaccines, even for paying of electricity bills or water bills, everything around Cameroon now is, is hitched to quote-unquote uh, quote uh, connections. Who do you know on the inside? When you know someone, then you can have service that is fast, that is efficient. Even with ID cards, when you do your ID card, if you know someone on the inside, you have it in good time. And that someone is not necessarily your relative. It's someone that you can tip off you know, to, to give you uh, the ID card in good time. And it runs across every sector. And that is why now when people are looking at individuals instead of a system, and we could go on and on with these complaints, but I think we, we, we can build on what works. An example of something that works, a sector that works now in public service delivery that is efficient to a very large extent, and we can use that as an example, is a passport service. Mm -hmm. Before, if you needed your passport in normal time, you needed to know someone who could get a bribe, you know, and facilitate. And it was done as a favor. So you'd actually be thanking the person for <laughs> helping you get your ID, your passport in one week. But now we have a service where you don't need to know anybody. You don't need to have a connection. You can go online. You know, you register, you go to the passport center, you get a passport. That is something that works. And we think that if, if we can extend this to public health, to education, to recruitment, then we can have a public service system that works for everybody, not just for those who know someone. Because as we speak, there are people who are waiting for their ID cards for two years. Mm -hmm. Because you're what? Right. Because you don't know someone on the inside. But I bet you after this program, if someone on the inside has heard you say that, I say, hey, let me help you. You have it maybe by by Tuesday. So we need a system, <laughs> Killian, yes. that is not built on to you, yeah. who do you know. Mm -hmm. 
We need a system that is available, accessible to all Cameroonians, irrespective of the connection that you have. And this will also help curb the problem of tribalism because everyone wants someone on the inside who speaks like them, who has a name like theirs. But you know, uh, with, 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 uh, I think the passport service is working because uh, we have embraced you know, the digital opportunities that come with it. Exactly. When you have e-governance, we, we cut out all of these tribalistic connections that hold us back as a nation. So I think we need to build systems, not individuals, you know, uh, uh, hoarding control and blocking access to many people. That's one way uh, to do it. So we look at what works. Passport uh, sector uh, system is, is a good example of what works. We can build on that. But we need to fix what doesn't. And here I speak as a journalist. Mm. For us to fix what uh, does not work, we need to be clear about what does not work. People need to be free to say, hey, this is not working here. Only then can we be aware of what is not working to fix it. So press a freedom again. I'll come back to that. It's a whole topic. But people need to be free to say this is not working. And people need to be free to say this is working. Okay, thank you, you very much. And thank then we need to be open, Kilian, to what is possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you say this is not working, what is what is possible? Change. You need change in leadership at all levels. You need uh, 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 newer ideas. We need to be open. We need to be inclusive to people from different tribes, different political groups, because Cameroon is not uh, the buildings. Cameroon is the people. Mm -hmm. And if we want to remake Cameroon, then we need to be open to, to change from different genders, different youth groups, different political groups. And this can only come when people can clearly express and say, oh, this is what is not working, this is what is possible, and have the opportunity to be heard. It doesn't matter if you're from CPDM or not. You know, you yes. need you need that kind of inclusiveness. Of in, 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 inclusiveness. Inclusion, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, from the, uh, we're talking about public service delivery. The next thing we wanted to talk about was the strategic shift from uh, transactional to transformation. I think what what they've been saying is exactly what. They're right. Except except you you want to. No, they're 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 all they're, 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 they're all they're all correct. Yes. Uh, I just I just I just wanted to start by saying this that, uh, you know. Uh, we should disabuse ourselves of the notion that the government has always been in our lives. Mm -hmm. And it, within the Cameroonian context, when we talk about the state, the state, we mean the central government. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the innovations in education, in health, that has moved this country forward, they had nothing to do with the government. Who, n very few people might remember that the PNEU stands for Parents National Education Union. Mm -hmm. As it, it is, I call it the jewel in the crown of the Anglophone uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, sub system. Of sub system of education. Has nothing to do with the government. Parents get together, contribute their money. They, they define the pedagogic standards that their kids should 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 should, should follow. follow. Mm -hmm. Recruit the teachers and give their children the the, the, the the quality education that they need with very little government interference. You might want to. It might interest you to know, uh, Kilian, that the PNU Yaoundé started in the garage of prof mm -hmm. late, late Professor Munokoso at the initiative of late uh, Member of Parliament uh, Gwen. Gwen Burnley. Mm, okay. The GCE board was never an initiative of, of the government. Far from it, the government even wanted, didn't even want to have anything about it. It was teachers who sat in Bamenda, grouped themselves in tag, and said, listen, we can't just s sit back and watch the education system of our children go, go down the drain without doing anything about it. So they came up with the idea about creating a, an, exam, a, an examination board that will, that will manage the examinations from, eight, from, from A to Z, you know, down a, a, across the spectrum. So I'm giving you all these examples. I can tell you about the special, the Northwest Special Fund for Health. Mm -hmm. That is an organization that has greatly improved on primary health care delivery yeah. in the Northwest. Yeah. That was not really an initiative of the government as such. It was mostly limited to the Northwest province, led by a certain uh, Madame Tata, who of, is, is of late, unfortunately. These are all, I can even even uh, talk about the credit union system, which is now one of the greatest finance, microfinance institutions in Cameroon and the world, which was an initiative of the of the Catholic Church in Ginicom, Catholic Fathers in Ginicom, and, and, and empty uh, Manseka in Kumbo, Catholic teachers. Mm. I quote all these examples to, get to come to this point. That let us disabuse ourselves of the notion that government knows, the state knows all and can do all. Okay. In my book, I recommend that henceforth for, for enhanced public service delivery, the state should acknowledge its own shortcomings and, and, and say, okay, we shall assume the role of an enabling bystander where we shall set standards set defined the norms and let regional governments, fully functional regional governments and 
municipal councils do the, do the work because they are closer to the people and they have better knowledge base than the state and the central government. Killian, in 2010, uh, the World Bank was reporting that 90% of the public investment budget in Cameroon was still being implemented at the central government level and mm. less than 10%, as uh, he said, was going to the, to the councils. Yes. We need to invert that. It cannot be happening right now when we're talking about decentralization and then we give them f un unfunded mandates, give them responsibilities without money, and then expect them to, you know, to, 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 to create magic out of it. So this all seems to what we call about, what you're talking about, transformational leadership. Yeah. What is transformational mm -hmm. le le leadership? Leadership. It's a process whereby leaders and followers lift each other to a level of higher levels of morality and uh, performance so that it deviates from power holders mm -hmm. people who just hold power responsibility for the sake of it and the difference of us as i say in the book is transactional leadership model mm -hmm. which is a mere exchange of, of of gifts between followers and leaders without any enduring purpose so because you appoint me minister you give, you support my appointment uh, to a state of uh, to, to, to a, a position of, of responsibility i recognize you as my leader that should not be happening. We should have leaders at all levels that come up and, and move people for, uh, forward, you know, lift them to higher levels of uh, motivation, morality, and performance through vision, through uh, persuasion, through dialogue, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. And uh, also uh, jotted down certain areas. We have just about four and a half minutes to go to the end of this program. I uh, wanted us to talk about the role of the diaspora in remaking our country, the role of our elite, the role of uh, traditional rulers, the religious leaders, and uh, the international community. I think one of one person should take one of these and then we'll talk about beginning with you Nicolin. yeah i think i had uh, the need to leverage our human resources mm. talking of the diaspora no country has ever developed without a diaspora mm. because because of the crisis many people have gone to other countries and they were exiled in those countries for them for we to leverage on our diaspora we need to make the environment conducive for them to come back home there is no reason why a doctor that is exhaling in the U.S. with his human rights protected, his security and everything guaranteed, will come back to Cameroon because Cameroon is fatherland. When he cannot, when he goes out, he's not too sure to come back. Mm. He can pick a stray bullet at any time. We need to make the environment conducive. We need to give our youth a voice. New Stata is has been living, leading an advocacy for young people at 18 age to vote. These are, we have young people who are in activism as early as 15 years, mm. but they cannot vote for who their leaders are. So how do you expect them to to advance in their advocacy? We need we have our women. Women constitute a numerical majority of the population, and in all even gender documents in Cameroon, we are here to secure an affirmative quota for what percentage of women should be represented in elections and in nominative decision-making positions in Cameroon. We need all of these things. And yes, as thank Mr. You. Julius thank has you. said, thank let you. me please thank let just say one thing. Yeah. With all of these things in our setting, our transformative agenda for new directions, we need to prioritize peace and reconciliation. Thank so you. much has been done in these countries. The mothers of the military, when we talk peace and reconciliation, people are looking at the Northwest and the Southwest bambas and all whatnot. What about the mothers of the militaries that have been killed since the outbreak of this crisis? That is they correct. need that, to, that is, they that, need that to is know correct. what happened to their that, children. That is correct. Um, we're going around con to conclude. Sisters speak 237. What are you doing to transform and remake our country? Um, at Sister Speak, we are working to build the skills and uh, amplify the voices of minority groups, especially women and persons with disabilities. But as, sister, as a leader of Sister Speak, what I want to say on this platform is I'm calling on anyone in Cameroon who has a tack or a level that says you're a leader to interrogate your privilege. I said it at the beginning, I'm saying it again, because many leaders come from a perspective of, from a place of privilege, and we speak for people whose realities we are not in touch with. Okay. And so leaders, please just take some time, if you represent a group, make sure you actually know that group, you're in touch with the realities, and you give them space to express themselves. And as a young person, you asked me this at the beginning, mm. I will say any young person 
who is watching us today should take personal responsibility because when you're constantly waiting for your uncle who is out the diaspora when you're constantly waiting for the government and of course it's a place of the government to meet our needs through public service delivery you may um, you may find yourself lagging behind as an individual I took up the responsibility to say I was going to be the best version of myself I possibly could be We're and happy. so that's why you I had to study so for young people while we urge the government to deliver on their own and take personal responsibility for yourself to be the best version thank you, can you be. very much uh, Kaxton um, so um, thank you so much I I want to just you know conclude by you know j just chiming in with what he said um, earlier about the need for bringing the government does not really have the answers to all the questions that are you know pressing right now um, so that really calls for collaborative governance it calls for us to work with more uh, with more of the stakeholders that are out there that have not been sufficiently engaged in and the efforts of the government in trying to address the new developments and concerns that we we, we all share um so thank, thank you it, it, it's it's a very very important uh, recommendation so let's let's try to look at the different what are the different um actors having on the table to bring like civil society organizations yes thank you uh, thank and, you and, and, and the, the director yeah. indicating that we've used our time but we cannot go without having the last word from our dean on the set no uh, I, I just have one uh, one word to say i just want to stress this point that the things that unite us as cameroonians are far more important than the things that divide us. We share a lot in common. We share a lot in common, and we've proven that over time. So let us stop playing up our little differences and reinforce and strengthen our our our, our unity and our strength, and make this country be better and remake this country for 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 future generations. Thank you very much. And uh, you just listened there to Julius uh, Nyamkima Fondong, who is an author, governance expert, public uh, policy analyst, conflict management consultant. We happy to have had you here. We have just next to you uh, Nicolene Gwen Nusi Waze. She is a jurist, a gender and development expert. We are happy to have you uh, next to me, uh, Ateki Seta Caxton, Executive Director of uh, New of Network Solid for Solidarity, Empowerment and Transformation for All News Seta. Then our own Comfort Musa photojournalist, communications expert, and coordinator of uh, Sister Speak 237. Ladies and gentlemen, we just want to thank you, appreciate your time for tuning in to CRTV. There will be a full broadcast of this program on Monday at 2.30. Well, because we have sports, we have the World Cup, if there's anything, we're going to notify you. Thank you very much. Have a nice time. Thank you. Thank you very much.